thank you, Charlie. I'm glad you won that bet. Uh, I can say dildo 700 times in this dude's intro. <laughs> One. <laughs> so uh, uh, I've been a columnist for Crack.com for a few years and uh, uh, written some jokes there. Uh, I found one that doesn't require all the pictures and it's about a, a Japanese fighter with an incredibly hard head. So uh, I'm going to read it. It's about uh, combat, but I've tailored it so that the nerds can enjoy it. Because <laughs> I am also a nerd. <laughs> all right. Kazuyuki Ironhead Vegeta made a fighting career out of having a thick skull. This is that skull's story. <laughs> like many mixed martial artists, Vegeta started as a wrestler. Unlike many mixed martial artists, he never learned a second skill. It would take him 60 minutes to describe to you what he thinks a kick is. And he attempts submission holes the same way he tries on hats. Confusedly. Pulling in random directions with no results. That's because his skull is measurably thicker than a normal skull. If you were to take an x-ray of it, you'd fire your medical equipment for coming in to work drunk. <laughs> he was created by filling a cement truck with coconut sperm. And no one was more surprised than that cement truck. Since he was diagnosed with his head, he has been searching for the man who would one day destroy it. I understand many listeners don't follow or relate to the sport of mixed martial arts, but those readers are in luck because I speak fluent nerd. Each section will have a nerd explanation to help everyone enjoy this skill's terrible and rid ridiculous journey. Part 1, Fujita's Skull versus Mark Kerr, the birth of FFS. In Fujita's fourth professional fight, he faced 260 veiny pounds of world-class world -class wrestling and emotional issues named Mark Kerr. Using a style of kickboxing based around the tango and signaling rescue planes, Vegeta hoped he hopped around like a scarecrow in gunfire, while Mark Kerr blasted him in the face with punches and knees. Mark Kerr wasn't exactly Bruce Lee himself, but when you bench press 600 pounds, just swinging your paw through the air is gonna knock the salmon out of every river for two miles. And here's the nurse explanation part. To put the damage Vegeta's face took into perspective, steroid users couldn't measure their dicks for an entire year when Mark Kerr hit a button on a calculator and killed the number two. It's a thinker. Give me a moment. I write very intellectual dick jokes, I should warn everyone. <laughs> Somebody loves it. I'm sure you've seen a shortened bus filled with retarded children. Well, that was just a regular bus before Mark Kerr waved at it. <laughs> They're not all nice. <laughs> For three minutes, everything either fighter did resulted in a hard part of Mark Kerr getting smashed into Vegeta's medically impossible head. It looked like an industrial training video on how to turn a human into soup using just one naked man. <laughs> If I was Vegeta's family, I would have already been ordering a box of gorilla-sized diapers and flashcards so he could relearn all our names. <laughs> but this face suicide was all part of Vegeta's plan. After five minutes of savage anaerobic assault, Mark Kerr's brain and body agreed it was time to give up. He went fetal and Vegeta punched the back of his head for ten minutes. Which in back of the head time is fucking forever. <laughs> The surprising win led to the invention of the Fujita fight system, FFS, which would serve him well throughout his entire career. Let's go over the basics. Number one, receive beating until opponent falls asleep. Number two, maul opponent's unconscious body. Number three, realize that the celebration banana was a trick and that you've once again been led into a cage for safe transport. Vegeta's skull versus Ken Shamrock. Helmet laws are for pussies. <laughs> Next, Vegeta fought Ken Shamrock. Throughout Ken's long MMA career, this is easily the greatest performance he has ever had. He unloaded on Vegeta. Every punch and kick of every combination landed on Vegeta's chin. 
I Swear Fujita, mailed Ken Shamrock a list of every move he was going to do, and Ken got together with Jean-Claude Van Damme and to plan the most destructive and beautiful ways to counter them. Jean-Claude maybe did a little bit of consulting on Fujita's side too, since the only move that Fujita landed in the entire fight was a crotch attack. <laughs> He likes to punch people in the dick, if people aren't familiar with the Jean-Claude Van Damme films. So I'll stop to explain my jokes also, I should warn you. The showdown continued for six minutes. Ken Shamrock's extensive martial arts experience versus a mix-up in Vegeta's head DNA. But Shamrock was no match for FFS. Something strange happened. Ken beat this man so hard that he no bullshit started having heart palpitations in his corner through in the towel. Seriously. Fujita took a beating so severe that the man doing it had a goddamn heart attack. I, I guess it was a strategy devised by a stand-up coach, Anna Nicole Smith's vagina. And while doctors were treating Ken Shamrock, the only thing that was heard on Fujita was the team of archaeologists that happened to be exploring his skull's upper mantle at the time. Okay, now here's the inert explanation. When creating characters in video games, you often have to make sacrifices. For example, your rogue doesn't have enough points to learn mutilate and killing spree. It's the same thing when scientists create igneous skull punching bag monsters. If you spring for invincible head, there aren't enough points left over to put into agility. Vegeta actually has a negative 65 to dodge, which means cars instinctively swerve into him. <laughs> takes him 10 minutes in a man-shaped hole in the wall to get through a doorway. <laughs> now we have Fujita's skull versus Crow Cup. Fujita's skull takes a job at the female ejaculation plant. <laughs> Japan has a childlike fascination with strange matchups. If two things are stupidly different, Japan will put them in a cage and see what happens. <laughs> All their fight cards have at least one match between a giant fat guy and something that looks like it should be making Christmas toys. <laughs> if a man with no arms and a man with no legs started learning karate, the same light bulb would appear over every Japanese head. <laughs> That's right. Glue them together and see if it can kill a panda. Through their own experiments, every Japanese parent knows exactly how many rhinoceros beetles you have to put in a baby's crib to make it a fair fight. <laughs> and I guarantee you that when the first cheeseburger comes to life, Japan will throw it in the ring with a sumo wrestler before it ever gets a chance to lead us to our better lives in the sky. <laughs> so it's no surprise that Fiber Motors decided to put him in a ring with Krokop. Take the man with the crazy hard head and put him in the ring with the guy who kicks heads crazy hard. The result might surprise you. Partially exploded head. In an explosion of blood and duh, Crow Cop measured Vegeta's <laughs> slow motion takedown attempts and threw a knee into his eyeball just as he was coming in. Fujita didn't notice. It takes so long for light to reach the center of his head that he wouldn't even know when one of his eyes has gone for 11 minutes. <laughs> So all he did was finish the takedown and try to drown Crow Cop in ocular blood. The referee had to inflate a life raft just to paddle over and stop the fight. So here's the explanation. For a Japanese fight promoter, Fujita's cranium is like a boss monster they're seeing for the first time. They are so compelled and excited to destroy it, but the only thing they can do is hit it with every weapon in their inventory until something works. This was their Eureka moment. Holy water bounces off. He free hits for zero. Bubble Lead actually heals him. Oh fuck, look at how much Crow Cop took off. <laughs> so his next fight was Crow Cop again. We must destroy that which we love. After engineers designed a needle capable of it, they stitched Fujita's skin back together and he was given a rematch against Crow Cop. Fujita should win this one, right? I mean, what are the odds that something with almost 100% certainty would happen twice? <laughs> In what took him 29 seconds, Fujita watched the 18 seconds of the first fight carefully and devised the perfect plan to defeat Krokop. <laughs> Somebody's smart over there. 
<laughs> okay, but here's his perfect plan. Exactly the same thing. <laughs> he charged in with takedowns and Crow Cop countered by kneeing him in the head. But instead of taking them with the front of his head, he blocked them with the top of his head. For crashing knee after crashing knee, Crow Cop's giraffe legs were screaming for Vegeta's spine to become paralyzed and the fucking thing was too stupid to understand. <laughs> FFS doesn't work against Krokop. Instead of throwing frantic combinations, Krokop likes to take his time and throw one big kick that only gets described during a eulogy. You can't tire him out or give him a heart attack by pretending to be a soccer ball. The only thing Fujita's invincibility did for him in this fight was let Krokop's knees manufacture cubic zirconium against his forehead until time ran out. Here's the nearest explanation. Imagine for a moment that Scooter, the gobot that turns into a scooter, fought the Constructicons. <laughs> if moments into the fight they formed Devastator and stomped on him, you'd be surprised at how simple and unsurprising it was. That's how this fight was like. No one could have predicted that every single fucking obvious thing we expected would happen. <laughs> His next fight. Fujita's Skull versus Fedora Emelianenko, A New Hope. <laughs> By this point in his career, the world now knows that Kazuyuki Fujita has only two assets, a clumsy takedown and a force field where his brain's reflex is <laughs> So Pride Fighting Championships decides he's ready to take on the best fighter in the world, Fedor Emelianenko. Fight promoters apparently gave up on finding someone who could beat the guy, and now they were just using him to conduct further stress tests on Fujita's skull. <laughs> they were sure that Fado would be the thing to finally crack it open and allow evil scientists to reverse engineer his remains. Almost certainly to grow more durable sex robots. <laughs> and the other unkillable robots to fuck them. <laughs> then Fujita did something that surprised even him. He almost won. He landed a knee buck and counterpunch that to this day is the closest thing anyone has come to being Fedor. This was written a couple years ago. He's lost a couple times. For all the fight fans out there. <laughs> In a waste of his body's natural punching bag camouflage, he was about to beat someone by hitting them. Unfortunately, Fedor found a practical solution to Fujita. Get behind him, grab his unbreakable head, and yank it the fuck off his body. <laughs> the official fight records call it a rear naked choke, but that's like calling Tiananmen Square a wet t-shirt contest. <laughs> If the ref hadn't stopped it, Fedor was going to take that head home to his spaceship and polish it. <laughs> the, the nurse explanation for this is I think that last part was already in nerd. I mean, sometimes it sneaks into the regular stuff. Next up, Vegeta's skull versus Vanderlei Silva on the wings of hope. Oh, is that Vanderlei Silva fan? Max murder. <laughs> Back to the hilarity. <laughs> Krokop proved that Fujita's head is living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. And then Fado proved that it will surrender if you start to sever it from its body. But Japanese fight promoters still hadn't gotten a chance to see someone just pound on it until it cracked. Will it explode when you expose its core? Is it filled with something that you can rape with an octopus? That's when it hit them. Vanderly Silva. That guy hates skulls. <laughs> At the time, the country of Japan was using Vanderlei Silva to control the fighter population. And they occasionally dragged him on a chain through the ocean to hunt whales in the least humane way possible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry again. The fight was a massacre. Fujita tried every both of his techniques against Vanderlei. <laughs> He slowly waited to get punched and laid on top of him without doing anything. <laughs> Neither worked, and Vanderlei eventually got to his feet and stalked Fujita like a Japanese octopus in an all-female prison. <laughs> he hit him as hard as you can hit someone many, many times. Then every time Vegeta fell down, Silva kicked him in the head as if he was going for a 70-yard field goal. None of this did anything. 
half the arena was crying since they thought they were watching one ape administer the death penalty to another, and the other half was dead from shockwaves. <laughs> Several kept punching him down, kicking him, watching him get up and starting from the top. Someone else had the ring, or probably just a chunk of shrapnel hit the bell, and the referee declared it a knockout. But Vegeta was already back up before the words left his mouth. Why'd they stop it? He had randomly right where he wanted it. <laughs> Uh, here's the nerd's explanation. Science can't explain this. Vanderlei dropped a shock and awe campaign on his head and couldn't hurt it. This fight was stopped only to get everyone's car alarms to shut up. It had nothing to do with Vegeta's safety. Vegeta was probably back to identifying simple shapes that very same night. <laughs> Next is Vegeta's skull versus James Thompson. James Thompson is an imposing figure. Imposing figure. So, so imposing. <laughs> I can't, why the fuck can I say imposing? So imposing that during the stare down, Fujita admired his abs and groin area and gave him an approving thumbs up. <laughs> it was unprecedentedly inappropriate. <laughs> but there was a science to this flirting. FFS works a lot better if your opponent comes at you in a completely incoherent homophobic rage. <laughs> And James Thompson did. <laughs> Thompson manhandled him, hitting him with hundreds of unanswered punches and knees. He was going to prove he wasn't gay even if he had to thrust every last bit of his vitamin supplemented shirtless body against Vegeta's beast-like hide. <laughs> yeah. It probably smelled like a leather smoothie, but gayer than that sounds. <laughs> Here's the nurse explanation for that fight. After taking an eight minute beating that mocked mankind's entire understanding of physics and medicine, Fujita started throwing his own punches. Drunken, woman-like punches. But when you're Dave Thompson and you just spent eight minutes heaving 550 pounds of violent meat around the ring, you'll take any excuse you can get for a nap. By this point in the fight, Fujita could have screamed boo and knocked him out. But he had to save his voice. He had a screaming date with Lou Ferrigno later. <laughs> I'll just let you picture that for a second, because I think that's a funny image. <laughs> Next is uh, Fujita's skull versus Alistair Overeem, the final crusade. Alistair Overeem is a Dutch kickboxer who looks like someone at Marvel Comics drew a man genetically engineered to fuck your girlfriend. <laughs> and at the end of 2009, this giant black Thor beast hit Uberton Texera with a, t with a knee that adjusted the Earth's tides. Police were already taping off Alistair's legs before Uberton dropped face first on the canvas with his, with his eyes open. During the replay, you can actually hear the knee call gunshot wounds pussies. <laughs> Japanese fight promoter saw this and had a great idea. Restraints that taste like fish! But right before that, this could be the man to finally shatter Fujita's iron head. They set up the fight for New Year's Eve. The 39-year-old wrestler with an advantageous birth defect versus six and a half feet of death-dealing emasculation. This wasn't just a battle between genetic perfection and someone born out of head sorcery. It was possibly Japan's last chance to experiment on this skull that had given them so much joy and baffling medical data over the years. Just short of the literal definition, the fight began with Alistair beating the shit out of Fujita. Kazuyuki Fujita has been in a constant state of what you and I would call near death for 10 years, but this is the first time I've ever seen him look scared. After Overeem landed two knees, Fujita backs into the corner, then sheepishly tries sneaking past. Alistair punches him back into the corner and lands a third knee that I swear lights on fucking fire before it impacts. Fujita goes down. But here's the crazy part. He doesn't get back up. He stays on the ground holding his head, as baffled as the rest of us. I have a theory that the previous 17,000 blows to the head all gave him amnesia, and this one Looney Tunes bomb gave, him, gave his head all his memories back. <laughs> Japan finally got what it wanted. Only there was no candy surprise inside Vegeta. There was no tiny pilot demanding to know why you humans broke his ape ship. <laughs> Just a guy with a decade's worth of fist craters and bad, and bad decisions catching up to him all at the same time. 
It'd be almost tragic if you could look away from the slow motion rippling of Alistair's muscles in the instant replay. <laughs> On the internet, I have like a video you could look at. It's very sexy. <laughs> so, it's an explanation. In the secret wars, the human torch was being choked by Ultron, a robot completely encased in adamantium. Obviously, fire doesn't do much against any metal from the cool Namium family, so Torch went Nova, so he could at least look awesome as he died. However, Ultron stopped. His shell was intact, but the Nova flames melted something important inside him. I think that's what we're dealing with here. I think Alistair couldn't figure out how to crack Vegeta's skull, so he simply hit it hard enough that everything inside it turned to liquid. One would imagine that we're talking about a brain, but remember, this is the same man who fought all these terrifying people with his face alone. <laughs> would a brain come up with that plan? There's still so much we don't know. I say we go back to the drawing board with Vegeta's skull experiments. Oh, Japan, I, I miss them already. <laughs>